Spring Church. Can you all stand and worship with us this morning?
I don't know if you can tell yet this morning, but I, uh, I had a cold this week, and I thank God, praise Jesus, I'm over it, but my voice doesn't know that yet, um, uh, and I, sometimes I get frustrated at God, I'm like, come on, God, I need my voice to sing, um, but I try to look at things as positive as I can, and the only really positive I can get out of it this morning is uh, that I've got a lower register this morning. I can sing in the, the really low notes. Um, so, but I know there's a lot more people this morning, even in this room, that are going through a lot more issues than just a cold, um, that are facing trials in this life and things that is just not a good time. And my prayer this morning is that God would give you peace, even in the midst of that even in the midst of pain and suffering, that God would be there holding your hands through every piece of it. And the cool thing is that God's not just here with you, but he is there at the end of your struggle. He is there waiting for you and excited to see your victory, your triumph that you had with the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And after that, you get a testimony. You get a story that can bring so much hope and so much thanksgiving to other people that might be going through something similar to what you're going through. And so even though you may be like, God, I I need my voice to sing, it opens up our new perspective to know about how God can make even some of our trials, our worst trials, into a, a beautiful blessing. God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, this 
spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of a lie. And as you speak, hundred billion galaxies above, in the vapor of your breath, the planets fall. The stars were made to worship so alive. You see it hard in every. Every burning star signal fire always. Creation sings your praises so Of my heart, all of my failure and pride. I wanna hear you created, the light of the world, abandoned in darkness to you die. And as you speak. So I could find it here. You left 
God, we thank you so much. We thank you for your loveliness. We thank you for your wonderfulness. We thank you that you are the king through all things. God, I pray that you would begin to just prepare our hearts for whatever you have to speak to us this morning. God, please just begin to mold and shape our minds to be and look more like you. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So the caroling was actually part of a cover-up. We were there as a family of five. We're surprised with the best Christmas ever. Serena Norse is a mother of three and a nurse. Right now, she's fighting an aggressive second round of cancer. Tonight, after a pop-up performance, the group Best Christmas Ever delivered a haul of gifts at rival Santa's sleigh. It's really about showing these people that, um, although they're going through probably the hardest time of their life, that they're cared for. We were also able to raise $9,000 for bills for your family. Okay, that's too much. Um, they also provided a gift that's true value is more than it's worth, a new van to get Serena to and from her doctor's appointments. Here's your key. Are you kidding me? Uh -huh. oh. okay, it's all yours. This year, the Norse family is finding strength in faith and friends and are thankful for the blessings along this tough journey. 2020 is something that I don't think any of us will ever forget, um, but this definitely brightens things up and um, puts things into perspective. Merry Christmas! Best Christmas Ever partners with local companies to make these surprises possible. This year, they had six times the amount of nominations to help families. We put more information about how to get involved on our website. What if every day you woke up with unstoppable passion and a sense of purpose that moved you towards something greater? A life marked by faith and a love that breaks down barriers and by dreams that challenge us. That would be an epic life. But here's the thing. That epic life doesn't come to those who sit back and wait for it. It only comes to those who pursue it relentlessly with everything they've got. And that's the heart of our new teaching series called Relentless Pursuing the Epic Life, which starts on Sunday, October 27th. We'll uncover your purpose and dive into what it looks like to relentlessly pursue that purpose. We'll discover how to step out in bold faith. We'll surround ourselves with people who push us forward and tap into the strength that only God can provide. This is a series that will stretch you, it will inspire you, and it will refresh you. It all starts on Sunday, October 27th at 10 a.m. at Meadow Spring Church in Chaska. And I'm inviting you to come. Thanks for listening. I'll see you on October 27th. Good morning, Meadow. Hey, we are super excited for the best Christmas ever. It's going to be awesome. What an awesome opportunity, not just to, to bless families temporarily, but man, stuff like that has an impact on generations and generations and generations. All right, so if you want to be involved with that, if you want to help participate about that, we have kind of three avenues for you to go. Um, avenue one um, is go on their website, and you have the awesome opportunity to nominate a family. Um, kind of explained on the video if they have all the information you need on the website on how to do that. Um, the second thing um, is you can help us reach our giving goal of $10,000 um, to help bless families. And like I said, it's just going to be awesome. And lastly, if, you, if that's something that you just want to be a part of, you have the opportunity um, to join the team. And so that would be super cool. I'm thinking about it myself. How awesome is it just to be used by God to help bless um, other people? All right, next, if this is your first time here or you've been coming here for a while, you know the drill. Um, fill out a Connect card. We just want to get to know you, and it's an opportunity for you to get to know us as well. Um, if it's your first time, you can take that Connect card and go to the welcome desk, and we just want to meet you and give you a gift. And next, something I'm super, super excited about, this Thursday at 7 o'clock 
in the multi-purpose room, there's a young adult growth group taking place. Or if so, if you are a young adult, if you know any of young adults, you know exactly where to send them Thursday at 7 um, to where we can just pour into each other, study the word, get to know each other, um, and grow deeper in our faith. I'm super excited about that. And lastly, um, man, so this summer, I've talked a lot about it. I'm sure most of you know, we had the awesome opportunity to go to camp. The thing with like camp and doing things with our youth group is um, sometimes they cost some money. And so um, we had a special family come up to us and just say, hey, Judah, like, we just want you to know that like we want students to encounter God at camp. So whatever you need, reach out to us. And so I was number crunching and it turned out like we were we were pretty short financially on what was taking like taking the students to camp. We were going to take a big hit and this family stepped up and because of that so many of our students got to encounter God. And it was actually funny cuz like a week ago I was at youth group and uh, the younger the youth group students just kind of say random things. Um, and I don't understand it, and most of it I let it fly over my head, like about like Minecraft and things that I have no idea about. And I was sitting there, and all of a sudden I was playing basketball, and I hear this little voice behind me say, "Yeah, so uh, my parents pay Pastor John." And I'm like, "What? Are you t- like, what are you talking about?" They're like, "Yeah, so like uh, my parents tithe here, and I just know that that goes to Pastor John." So like, basically, without us, like. Pastor John wouldn't have a house, any of that stuff. And I'm like, that is not exactly how it works, okay? How it works is that, man, through the giving is it's, what's so cool is that student didn't even know that, man, that the giving enabled them and their friends to come and encounter God. So the giving doesn't just come to the pockets. It actually goes to bless kids in the church, to bless families in the church, to do something like that. So if you are um, thinking about that and you wanted to partner with us, um, and just help people find a refreshing relationship with Jesus Christ. Here are your four safe, easy ways to do that, all right? And lastly, man, what, how you know you're in a healthy congregation is you know you're in a healthy congregation by having the opportunity to get poured into um, by so many different people, right? And so today, if you guys could put your hands together for one of the wisest, smartest dudes I've ever met, Mr. Dave, all right, round of applause. There we go. Good morning. Uh, For those who don't know me, uh, my name is Dave Pleckenpole. Uh, Meadow Spring has been the church home for my wife, Bonnie, and I since uh, 2002. And over the last 22 years, we've seen some amazing, amazing things happen here. Uh, I currently serve on the worship and tech teams as well as on the elder board. And I was on staff as an associate pastor from 2005 through 2008, uh, working on small group development, uh, worship programming, and worship technology. I want to thank Pastor John for the opportunity to share with you this morning. And John, we're wishing you a speedy and full recovery from your knee surgery. I'd also like to thank Derek and Travis for the amazing messages that they've had to share the last two Sundays. Uh, thank you for sharing what God has had on your heart. I would like to start this step this morning with a question that will give most of us here a moment of pause before answering. A question that will leave many followers of Jesus, especially men, struggling to find an honest answer. That question is, how's your prayer life? If you're anything like me, there are times when your prayer life is good. It's like God is sitting right there across the table, and you're having the most awesome conversation as if you're talking with your closest friend. Then there are times where your prayer life's not so good. It's like you're in a Teams or a Zoom call. Your microphone's not working, your speakers aren't working, your audio's failing, there's no communication at all. And then there are times when the only time that you pray is mindlessly before a meal. Times when your spirit is so dry that praying is like spitting sand, and prayer is the last thing that crosses your mind. And there are times where it's like prayer. What's the point? No matter where a person is on this continuum, We can all use a boost in our prayer life. And today we're going to cover what prayer isn't, what prayer is, and the four purposes of prayer. Now, if I told you that tomorrow morning at 7.30, you had the opportunity for a face-to-face, in-person, 
sit down meeting with Jesus for 15 minutes, what would you ask for? If you could ask him for anything at all, what would you ask for? Would you ask for protection, a new job, a new house, money? What would you ask for? The disciples had exactly this opportunity. In the book of Luke chapter 11, we are told that they came to Jesus one day and had a request. And that request was, teach us to pray. Now, of all the things that they could have asked for, why did they ask that question? Well, I think it was because they saw the results of his prayer life. They saw him pray, and they saw what happened. I find it interesting that as they observed Jesus, they saw him preach the greatest sermons ever preached. They saw him do miracles, heal the sick, raise the dead, calm the storm in the sea, and a lot of other really awesome things. Yet, we don't read of them saying, Lord, teach us to preach, or Lord, teach us to do miracles, or even Lord, teach us to raise the dead. They were smart enough to connect the dots. Instead of asking for those other things, they asked, teach us how to pray. They saw that prayer was the life support system of Jesus. They recognized that prayer was the key to Jesus' life. And for us, as followers of Jesus, there's nothing more vital than prayer. I'm sure we can all agree that there are a lot of faulty misconceptions about prayer, a lack of understanding of how prayer works, why we pray, and what to pray. Some think that prayer is like a magic wand. You just wave it over something and presto changeo, you get what you want. Or that God is kind of like the genie from Aladdin. You rub the lamp, God pops out and poof, what do you need? Poof, what do you need? Poof, what do you need? And we somehow think that because we rub the lamp that God is obligated to grant our each and every wish. Some people treat prayer like a first aid kit, only to be used in case of an emergency. And for a goodly number, prayer is exactly like that, only to be used in case of an emergency. It's a last resort. When things finally fall apart, then we pray. I have been personally very guilty of praying exactly like that. We try everything else. Google, Reddit, friends, horoscopes, WebMD. And when all these other things have been exhausted, then we pray. What I've learned over time and this is going to sting just a little bit, is that whatever source we turn to first before turning to God in prayer, that thing is the object of your faith. For many, prayer is like a tug of war, a religious con game that we play with God, where we try to convince God to do something nice for us. In our minds, we have the idea that God is some cold-hearted dictator sitting a million miles away in outer space and we have to beg and plead to convince him to do something nice for us. We keep pestering God, like a little kid pesters his mom in the grocery store. I'm gonna stand here and hold my breath until you buy me Count Chocula. And we believe that we have to pester God and pester God and pester God until he gets so irritated that he says finally, okay, I'll give it to you. Now probably the most worst misconception we have about prayer is for most people, prayer is simply a religious duty. The basic motivation behind it is guilt. I know I should pray more. I ought to pray. It becomes a duty. You have a sense of obligation that if you don't pray, you will end up on God's naughty list. And as a result, we go through a meaningless ritual that becomes a totally mindless rut. We learn memorized phrases. We get caught up in religious cliches. We say the same things over and over and over again. It's totally, totally meaningless, but we know that we ought to do it. It becomes something that has to be endured rather than something that is to be enjoyed. Now, it's difficult to get motivated about prayer if we go around saying, I should pray, I must pray, ah, I have to pray. If prayers become a duty, then the entire point of prayer has been missed. And today, it is my goal to remove some of these misconceptions and to share with you the four purposes of prayer. 
In the book of John, chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16 are the last words of Jesus to his disciples, the last conversations he had with the 12 before he was crucified. And in these four chapters, he is telling people repeatedly, I am going to die and then be resurrected and go back to heaven. I am not going to be here physically, but I am going to be with you spiritually. I'm going to put my spirit in you, the Holy Spirit, and you can still talk to me even though I'm not here physically. You can talk to me through prayer. And he gives us four reasons or purposes for prayer. First off, prayer is an act of dedication. It is an opportunity to express our devotion to and dependence upon God. It is an act of dedication in which we say, God, I need you. Now, the biggest struggle we have with that kind of dedication is that we often don't feel a dependence on God. We don't feel that we need God. We think that we can do it ourselves. And ever since the Garden of Eden, mankind has grossly overestimated our ability to do life. We go through life thinking, I don't need to pray, because this is something I just do. And the biggest struggle we have with prayer is admitting that we need God's help. I have to admit I'm inadequate. No one likes to do that. I have to admit that I'm helpless, and I am dumb as a stump about this thing called life. We have to admit, I need your help. And as long as we believe that we are self-sufficient, if we think that we have it all together, prayer will have little to no meaning. Prayer is an act of dedication. God, I admit I have a need. I admit that I need your help in my life. Prayer is a declaration of dependence upon God. In John chapter 15, Jesus gives us an illustration in which he is like a vine and we, his followers, are the branches. In that passage, we read, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone doesn't remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Now, this is an amazing promise, but it is not a license for us to treat God like a robot or some kind of vending machine. I want you to read that part carefully. The word if makes it conditional. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. If we are truly abiding in Jesus, as a branch connected to the vine, fully dependent on his life, looking to him for the inflow of his life into us, directing our will, filling us with his life, and if his words are truly abiding in us, his words transforming our thinking from self-will to being in harmony with God's will, then, by meeting those ifs, our hearts and minds are brought into alignment with God's heart and mind, and our prayers will obtain what we ask. This is a great illustration. Just like a branch is connected to a vine to the point where you can't tell where the one ends and the other begins, we are to be inextricably bound to Jesus fully dependent upon him for everything that we need for life. Prayer is an act of dedication. Secondly, prayer is an act of communication. I think we can all agree that most of our problems in life are communication problems. Most of the friction that we have in marriage, friendships, and work stem from poor communication. Poor communication leads to a lack of understanding, which in turn leads to frustration and strained relationships. You can't understand a person unless you communicate with them. The same goes for our relationship with God. We can't understand God and his will for our lives unless we communicate with him. 
Most of us who grew up in the Cold War era are familiar with something called the Red Phone, which was a direct phone line between the President of the United States and the premier of what was in the Soviet Union. You see, way back in 1962, there was this international incident called the Cuban Missile Crisis. It was a standoff between President Kennedy and Premier Khrushchev over the deployment of nuclear missiles in Cuba. We nearly went to war over it. One of the reasons we didn't go to war is because communication was established called the hotline. A literal red phone was placed on the desk of the president, and a red phone was placed on the desk of the premier. It was put in place so there would be no misunderstanding. If at any time the president or the premier thought the other party was doing something wrong, they could simply pick up the phone and communicate. Now, the hotline is still in use, but it's no longer a phone line. It's a computer network. And to ensure that the system will function in the event of an emergency, Russian and American technicians send test signals to each other every hour. Communication is vital in international relationships. It is vital in a Christian's life. Prayer is both an act of dedication and an act of communication. We cannot effectively communicate with someone unless we know our relationship with that person. So what's our relationship with God? In verse 15 of John chapter 15, Jesus says this, I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. One of the reasons that we can talk to God about anything and everything is because we're friends. However, the relationship for a follower of Jesus goes deeper than that. We find in Matthew chapter 6 in the model of prayer that Jesus gave us, he told us to address God as Father. And in Galatians chapter 4, verse 6, we are told, Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who cries out, Abba, Father. Now, the word Abba is an Aramaic word that means father, but it is in a much more deep, deeper, connected, relational sense, um, very much like a, how a little kid has absolute dependence and devotion upon their daddy. I want you to take a moment and to think about that. A follower of Jesus is not only friends with God. It goes deeper than that. For followers of Jesus, God is our Father in the deepest, most intimate, relationally connected sense. We can open our hearts to God, and we can talk to him about absolutely anything and everything. If you're having a great day, he wants to hear about it. If you're having a terrible day, he wants to hear about it. If you've messed up, he wants to hear about it. The thing that we struggle with is that we have a hard time believing our identity as God sees us. We have a hard time believing that God is really interested in us. We have a very difficult time believing that the creator of the universe, of all things seen and unseen, is actually interested in our car payments, rent, mortgage, the struggles that we are having at work, school clothes for the kiddos, traffic jams, and everything else. And when you have that light bulb moment, when you realize how much God really loves you, prayer will no longer be a problem. Why? Because we love to talk to the people who love us the most. And if you find that prayer is a duty, a routine that you don't look forward to going through, it means that you have not fully grasped just how much God is in love with you and how much he is interested in the things that are of interest to you. If you have to go to God and talk with him about the things that are of no interest, who's going to want to do that? Nobody. We love to talk to those who love us the most. God says not only are we friends, you are my dearly loved child. And we need to come to terms that the most important thing about you is that you are loved by God. Prayer is an act of dedication. It is the way that we express our dependence on God. Prayer is an act of communication. 
It is the way that we communicate with God. It's our life support system, the umbilical cord of the Christian life from which we draw our strength. Thirdly, prayer is an act of supplication. Now, supplication is a $10 word that simply means request. And in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, we are told, don't worry about anything. In everything, with your prayers and supplications, make your requests known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We are to take all of our needs to God. Don't worry about anything, which for a lot of us, it's a tall order. I hold a double doctorate in worry. In everything, with prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God. Tell him about what you need. Prayer is an act of supplication. It is the way that we make our requests. The result of you asking your requests in prayer is peace of heart and mind. The fact of the matter is, prayer is God's chosen method of meeting our needs. The Bible teaches that there are some things that God has promised to do only if we pray. Now, some people think, well, God knows what I need. Therefore, I don't need to ask. He'll just give it. However, God has set it up in his plan that there are some things he will only do if you ask, if you pray. When we read the New Testament and read about the New Testament Christians, we find that they were joyful, contagious, and enthusiastic about life. They had power in their lives. They saw amazing things happening on a regular basis. Why don't we see that happening in our own lives? Why don't we have that kind of power in our own lives? Well, the truth is, it's because we don't ask. In the book of James, we are told that you have not because you ask not. And over 20 times in the New Testament, the Bible says, ask, ask, seek, knock, and keep on asking. There's a story of a guy who died and went to heaven. And all over heaven were these warehouses. And inside these warehouses were these tremendous gifts, fantastic things, spiritual situations, homes, jobs, happy families, all kinds of really great gifts. And the guy says, Lord, what's up with all these gifts? Jesus replied, well, there's a tag on every one of them. And the tag on each one says exactly the same thing. So the guy goes over and he looks at one of the tags and it reads, never ask for. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, a great pastor in England, once said that God never shuts his storehouses until you shut your mouth. You have to ask. In Luke chapter 11, verse 11, Jesus is talking. And he says, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, if I, being an imperfect dad, know how to give good gifts to my kids and know how to answer their requests, how much more does God, who is perfect, in perfect love, know how to give us good gifts? God delights in answering our requests. And lastly, prayer is an act of cooperation. Now, this last point is probably one of the most exciting things about prayer. It is an act of cooperation. God has sovereignly chosen in his wisdom that we can cooperate with him in his plan by praying and hoping to see his work done here on earth. Prayer is God's program. Prayer is God's chosen method of operation. Prayer is God saying, I have chosen to limit myself to what I can accomplish on earth by simply limiting myself to the faith of my children on earth. What they believe me for, I will do. When we pray for other people, we are cooperating with God. We are teaming up with God to accomplish God's work in the world. And one of the amazing things about prayer is that it is not limited by time or space. Prayer is limited, limitless in its scope. 
The prayers that Jesus prayed 2,000 years ago are still being answered today. The prayers that I pray today can be answered three days, three weeks, three years, three decades, or three centuries from now. Prayer is not limited by time. And prayer is not limited by distance. You can pray, and it's like sending a missile. I could pray today for somebody in England, and it's like sending a missile straight into that person's heart, and I would never have to leave Minnesota. I can pray all over the world. I can get up tomorrow morning and pray for missionaries and Christian workers all around the world. And those prayers would penetrate those places, touching the hearts and lives of the people who live there. Prayer is limitless in its power. People may reject your beliefs, reject your arguments, even reject you as a person. But they are totally defenseless against your prayers. They have no defense system against prayer. Your prayers go straight to the heart. The Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs, chapter 21, verse 1, that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. Like changing the course of a river, God can change the course of history by our prayers. Now, often we are faced with impossible situations where we simply don't know what to do. We get to thinking, well, I guess the only thing I can do is pray. Now, if you stop to think about it, that is an absolutely great place to be. Prayer is our greatest resource. Through prayer, we are no longer trying to work it out on our own. We have God's power behind us. Jesus tells us over and over, if you ask, I will answer. If you ask, I will do. He says, your part is the asking. My part is the doing. Now, this is great because he is a lot, in a lot better position than you or I, and he has a lot more resources at his command. Jesus says, if you pray, I will do. Our part in cooperating with God's plan in the world is prayer. The most important thing you can do as a follower of Jesus is pray. Now, who do you think are going to be the greatest heroes in heaven? Is it going to be the Billy Grahams, the great Christian leaders that we've had over the centuries? I don't think so. I think the greatest heroes in heaven are all the unknown people who prayed for these other individuals. The people who prayed for their ministries and for God to touch the hearts and lives of the people to whom they preached. I believe that God blessed these ministries because of the countless unknown people who cared to pray. You see, in God's eyes, there are no unknowns or little people. Prayer is the most important thing you can do. D.L. Moody, who is also a great pastor, once said, every great movement of God can be traced to a single praying, kneeling figure. And historically, great movements of God often begin with one person who decided to do something. For example, in 1857, there was this businessman named Jeremiah Lanfear who decided to start a prayer meeting on Fulton Street in downtown New York City. Only a hand handful of people showed up to that first prayer meeting on September 23rd. But Lanfear was persistent, and they kept meeting for prayer. Then something dramatic took place. The stock market crashed, and suddenly the prayer meeting grew. Then prayer meetings began popping, out, popping up throughout New York City, and within six months, 10,000 people were gathering for prayer within the city, calling on the name of the Lord. And within 18 months of that first prayer meeting on Fulton Street, an estimated 1 million people had come to faith in Jesus Christ. It wasn't orchestrated. It was not a campaign planned by people, by a church, or an organization. Rather, it was a work of God in which he poured out his spirit because of the prayers of one kneeling, praying person. Prayer is an act of dedication, communication, supplication, and cooperation. Now, to wrap up this series of my one prayer for Meadowspring, I want our church to be a praying church. 
A praying church is a church that is committed to carrying out God's plan here on earth. A praying church is an enthusiastic church. Churches that pray see God move in extraordinary ways, and that gets people excited. Through prayer, we see lives transformed, relationships restored, jobs and financial situations worked out. A praying church sees countless answers to prayer that simply leave us amazed at how great God really is and how much he really does care about what happens to us. A praying church is a growing and happy church that sees God act, and when you pray and get answers, your joy is full. There's really nothing more exciting than seeing answers to prayer. You get excited, it becomes contagious, people want to get involved. It's often been said that if you're on fire for Christ, people will come from miles around to watch you burn. Now, I want you to take a moment and to ask yourself a very honest question this morning. What are you lacking in your life right now simply because you haven't asked for it? Think of one specific thing that you can pray for. What is uppermost in your mind right now? What's your greatest need? What would you like to ask God for? He is patiently waiting to hear from you, his dearly loved child. Now, it's exciting to think about that we are going to have answers to prayers for the very things that you're thinking about right now. And I want you to pray for a couple of things. One, I want you to pray for the requests that you're now thinking of. And I want you to pray for next Sunday service here at Meadow. Even pray about somebody who you can bring with you next Sunday. So for the remaining days of this week, I really want you to focus on praying for your requests and for next Sunday's service. And then, would you pray, Lord, just like the disciples, teach me to pray. Now, maybe you've been a follower of Jesus for a while and prayer's been kind of boring for you. Well, prayer isn't the problem. The problem is, is you've forgotten how much God loves you and desires to hear from you. Prayer is not to be a duty. Prayer is to be a delight. Not something that you endure, but something that you enjoy. Now, in closing, it seems only fitting to spend some time after talking about prayer, that we actually close with prayer this morning. So I want you to take a couple minutes and just uh, pray with me here. Dear God, teach me to pray. Jesus, thank you for calling me your friend. Father, you have heard all the requests the people were thinking this morning. And we, we believe that you will move in these situations in our lives. Father, we pray for our church, that it will grow, and countless numbers of people will come into a refreshing relationship with Jesus as a result of what you are doing right here at Meadow Spring. I'm excited for what you are going to do in our lives and in our communities in the coming weeks. I'm excited for the lives that are going to be changed as we learn what it means to really pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I'd like to thank you all for coming today, and uh, I guess we'll see you again all next, next week Sunday. Thanks.